Hey everybody, welcome to another episode of Off Script with Pastor Jared. Before we get into anything at all, I would like to ask a sincere favor of you. Uh, whatever you're listening on, preferably if you're listening on Apple Podcasts or Spotify Podcasts, if I could get you to leave us a rating and review on the Kirby Woods Podcast, I would greatly appreciate it. Uh, we just don't have nearly enough ratings and reviews for the amount of listeners that we have. Uh, I know more of you are listening than the ratings and reviews that we have. So if you would give us a kind, favorable, yet honest review, I would really appreciate it. Thank you guys for doing that for me. Uh, today, I want to talk about a topic that was a little on the lighter side. It's a new year, and I wanted to have some fun with you guys I'm riding solo today. It's empty in this room. I don't even have uh, I don't even have Isaac, my producer, in here. No guests. It's just me and you. We're just hanging out. And um, I want to talk to you today about a topic of trends. Looking forward to the new year, and uh, a lot of a lot of people, a lot of bloggers, will give what they think to be the uh, church trends, or the spiritual trends, or the uh, the kind of cultural trends of the upcoming year of 23, and I printed two different articles from two guys that I listened to as I would say I don't, I really don't give them, (laughs) I don't listen to them too deeply, I'll check their articles, I'll see how they're doing, I'll read their stuff, I don't live and die by what they say, I don't want you to think that, I I just check in on them once in a while, Uh, those two guys are Tom Rayner, number one, and then Carrie Newhoff is number two. Uh, pretty much those give me two different perspectives on the, the ministry world. Rainer's a bit more buttoned up, more used to the Baptist world, and uh, he's worked at Lifeway before, so he's a little more what, what our comfort zone is. Um, Newhoff is a bit more modern, hip, trying to um, be Mr. Cool, uh, reaching all the young people, non-denominational guy, online, big online ministry guy. And I think it's interesting that their trends lists that they put out for 23 definitely reflect who they are. Um, Rainer's definitely is going to reflect what he does now. He works for Church Answers, and um, Newhoff is is really all about all, a lot about online ministry. And so you can tell in their responses that they're kind of plugging what they do. But uh, I think there's some truth to what they do, and I want you guys uh, to be aware of maybe what's on the horizon. Uh, so again, they wrote these lists. I'm just reacting to the list and going to read it, read some of the points to you, give you my thoughts on it. Uh, but I did not uh, prophesy any of these truths. Um, I didn't write these points. Uh, this I'll tell you when when they're from each different author. Uh, the first one I want to look at is Tom Rainer's list, and these are he calls it the 2023 trends. And um, so basically, these are things that he is expecting to happen more so in 2023 than in the past, or maybe definers or year markers. Um, So I'll read it to you, maybe make a comment or two, and then I'll hit Newhoff's list, and hopefully we have a fun episode today. So Rainer's uh, first point, he says, local congregations will emphasize evangelism more at any point than in the past three decades. Well, I, amen. I, I hope that's right. That would be great. Um, he, he says church leaders understand they can't lead a church to growth with cultural Christians or transfer growth. If they truly desire to make disciples, they must begin with evangelism. Uh, I, again, I hope that's true. Look, if we're being honest, guys, um, numbers in our world, the Baptist world, are not good. Um, baptisms are down and salvations are down. Um, the last 10 years have not been our finest hour. Let's just say it. Um, we're planting more churches than ever. That's maybe one thing, but it's not resulting in a significant number of salvations. Uh, our, uh, there's a lot of stagnant churches, a lot of cultural stagnant churches, um, you know, so usually this is probably true in every field. It's definitely true in our field. You have some churches that are evangelistic, and they are pretty much pulling in the bulk of the salvations and baptisms. And then you have a broad swath of churches that will see no baptisms all year, and it's their norm. Um, so what what Rainer says, first point is that churches are going to start getting serious about evangelism again. And let me just tell you, Kirby Woods, I want to do that. 
I want to get our church uh, focused on personal evangelism and bring that back to the forefront um, and look to our neighbors and friends and those in our life and really have an intentional push toward evangelism in 23. So I'm down, uh, number one. Hope you guys are too. Number two, the increase in the growth of diversity in congregations will be its greatest ever in 23. Uh, his sub-comment is, Millennials see a monocultural generation as out of touch. Gen Z cannot imagine anything monocultural, especially a church. So I'm going to read between the lines, and uh, I'm guessing he's saying that the proliferation that we've become accustomed to of the you know Anglo church, the black church, the Hispanic church, the blah, 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 is going to thin out, and there's going to be more mixture between the churches. And... Uh, Great, that would be awesome. Um, I I think that that's probably going to happen. I would agree with him uh, because younger people um, are are going to make that more of a goal. I would say as as an aspiration, and um, pretty much every, if you go to you know a Walmart, you pretty much see what your congr your uh, community looks like. You know, it looks a lot like your Walmart, and so. Um, doesn't surprise me that our churches would start to reflect that. And, you know, I was in San Antonio uh, previous at Calvary Hills Baptist Church. I will say this about diversity. Uh, You have to be careful not to be making quotas and, and, you know, kind of use some of those, uh, I would say, woke tactics, you know, to make certain outcomes, certain outcomes that you want to take place. You have to be careful. I mean, some of that's good, but some of it's weird. Um, I, I told our folks there in San Antonio, I'm really not, um, here's the comparison. San Antonio was pretty much half Hispanic, half white, and Memphis is similar, but different. You switch out Hispanic and black. So Memphis is about half black and half white. And so it's similar situation. I I remember telling our folks there in, um, San Antonio, look, I'm not going to I'm not going to go out and specifically try to find uh, Hispanic people or Latinos or, or you know, uh, that's not my goal. I'm We're going to hit this community, and we're going to preach the gospel to every person, and we're going to treat everybody the same, and we're going to love on everybody, and who comes, whosoever will, may come. And um, you know what? It happened. that Our, our church got uh, a, a lot more diverse. There was a lot more... People with the last name, uh, you know, Martinez and Gonzalez and things like that showing up. And it was great. And and now they were they were all spoke English. It wasn't like we we birthed a, you know, a second Hispanic church. They were bilingual, uh, but the cultural barriers weren't there for them. They weren't bothered. They didn't feel like they had to come to a white church. It was just church and it was awesome. And so um, I think that can very well be possible here in Memphis as well. So praise God. I hope that's true. That's number two. Number three, uh, 2023 will be a record year for church adoptions. Church adoptions. Uh, He says an adopted church is a congregation that comes into the family care and authority of another healthier church. So this is would be like, we call it revitalizing sometimes. Let's say Kirby Woods uh, saw a church down the street that was maybe, you know, 20, 30, 40 folks that were on their last leg, maybe they're with or without a pastor in there. Um, sometimes they don't have a lot of money. Sometimes they, they're doing okay financially, but man, they just are spinning wheels and they're thinking about closing up shop and they can't do it anymore and they don't know what they're doing. Uh, Rainer is saying that there's going to be a movement where a lot of your churches, like your Hopefully Kirby can participate. Your Germantown Baptist, your Collierville's, your Bellevues uh, are going to, in, instead of just dec- you know saying, "Oh, what a sad situation," they're going to reach out to that church and say, "Hey, what can we do to to support you and make sure this doesn't happen?" Or help, or provide coaching, provide training, provide resources. Um, maybe if you want to, to like partner together in some way of you know you come under our banner and we'll take you on in some kind of capacity, that's that's growing, and there's going to be a lot more of that. So that's the trend. Number four, 
more churches will have specific global partners. Global partners. Uh, he says, churches in America will seek to partner with churches in other nations, particularly where the gospel is spreading. Um, the trend is more than an increase in mission giving. It's an intentional strategic partnership with a specific church or churches. Um, all right, I'm going to read between the lines and guess what he means. Uh, instead of giving giving a lump sum of money to Lottie Moon or to the cooperative program, you're going to see an increase in churches getting to know a specific missionary family by name and going to see them over and over again and going to and praying for them regularly throughout the year, receiving their prayer request and sending them things directly. Um, he didn't say that they're not that people are going to stop giving to Lottie and cooperative. I'm just I'm just saying I think that's what he means. And uh, at Kirby, we've been doing both for for a long time. Uh, we do give to those kind of big pot gifts, uh, Lottie Moon. And, but we also do keep direct contact with missionaries and go see them uh, specifically and, and lift them up by prayer. So we do both. And he's saying the trend is going to be a lot of your churches that just have been writing checks, sending their check to Lottie, are going to want to see a face. They're going to want a bit more of a personal contact with their missionary. And guess what? I think that's a great thing. That uh, That's a great trend. I hope that that trend is true. Number five, the time between pastors for churches will be longer than ever. Uh, let me see what he means. He says, I can remember when a long-term interim was 12 months. Okay, okay. Today, many churches have interim periods for two and three or more years. So he's saying the time period where churches are without a pastor in their interim phase is lengthening, not shortening. I don't know why that is. Uh, I, that's an interesting trend. But, um, yeah, you're going from, uh, you know, I, I when I actually left Calvary Hills, my previous church, I told him I would shoot for eight months, if at all possible, to have another pastor. And guess what? They did it. They've got a great pastor, Pastor Nathan Clardy there, and he's doing a great job from what I can tell. And um, it didn't require two years. But, hey, there's some reason that Rainer sees that churches are taking two and three years. I, to me, that's too long. I'm sorry. That's too long. But uh, So I'm not really happy about that trend. Maybe there's something behind that I don't understand. That's number five. Number six, the number of interim pastors will be greater than ever. Okay. This trend is obviously, he says, a corollary of the past, yes, a number five. Some interim pastors are preachers only. Other are intentional interims or transitional pastors uh, with consulting roles. Again, I don't understand why this would be, but Rainer's saying you're going to have an increase in interim pastors. Okay. Number seven, more churches will request consultations at any point uh, in, in American history. So apparently churches are getting more comfortable with bringing in consultants, um, outside firms to come and give them a, a rundown. I don't know, guys. Uh, I think Rainer's trying to sell you something. <laughs> Rainer's always selling something. Uh, I, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm very mixed on the consultant on the outside consultant thing. Uh, don't press me on it. I don't feel comfortable with, with it. I guess if you if you had to and you didn't know what you were doing, but um, to me a, a church like Kirby Woods, you know, or maybe the church you're attending, you've got you got bright people, you've got people that know their Bible, um, you know, you've got a mid you've got we've got the Mid South Baptist Association, Tennessee Baptist. There's people we can talk to. Uh, I just don't know about consultation firms. Anyway, the point that Rainer's making is that's going to catch on and grow. Of course, he could just be trying to sell you at churchanswers.com, churchanswers.com, <laughs> Tom Rainer. Uh, number eight, church autopsies will be the fastest growing area of research in American church. Okay, that's a pretty bold statement. He says, I wrote Autopsy of a Deceased Church in 2014, and the demand for that book began growing again in 2022. Uh, he says that's because the mass closings of churches after the pandemic. So um, basically, we're going to start seeing in the next year or two, Rainer says, the fruits of the post-pandemic reality 
of the churches that are not going to make it. it. They've been sputtering, you know, living on adrenaline for a couple years after the pandemic's over, but reality's going to set in. You're going to see churches close at a massive increase rate. And his point here is that the autopsy, looking back at what caused the church's demise, will be one of the top uh, research studies done in church life. I uh, hope that's not true. I think I understand why he says that. Number nine, more pastors and staff will become bivocational or co-vocational. Uh, so you're going to see, in, in Rainer's view, less full-time vocational pastors in ministry. You're going to see more bivocational. Uh, I feel like they've been saying this for years. Um, I haven't, I don't know that I've seen it. Uh, so I, I have no reason to doubt him. I just, I feel like I've heard this one for every year for like the last 10 years and I really haven't seen it yet. So who knows, maybe this will be the year. Uh, number 10, more pastors and staff will get their theological and ministry training in the church. Uh, I hope so. I love that trend. You guys, I, I think I've said this. If I haven't, let me say it. Huge passion of mine is training men to preach. I love it. it, it I think about it often. <laughs> it's one of my things that I uh, would love to get done in 23 at Kirby Woods on my short list of things I would love to accomplish is to gather a group of men interested in honing their craft in preaching. And uh, and again, I love, you know, I'm a, a Mid-America alumni. They're here in town. Um, but if I could provide something free of charge for guys that want to grow in it and they don't aren't really looking for a seminary degree, they just want to be good preachers of God's word when the opportunity arises, I would love the opportunity to share the knowledge I've got. Um, you know, whether that preaching opportunity is in our church, it could be, it could be in our church Sunday morning, Sunday night. Um, it could be at the Memphis Union Mission. It could be just being a great Sunday school teacher. Um, you know, nursing homes in town. You know, there's all there's opportunities to preach uh, different places, supply preaching, whatnot. I would love to be able to do that. So I hope that's a big. I hope that's a big trend because I think we need that. So that's Rainer's um, trends. Let's look at Newhoff's trends for the upcoming year. Um, these are going to be very different lists. I've, I haven't looked at them in depth, but I scanned them to, sh to see that these uh, lists are not the same. So they're seeing very different trends for the new year. Newhoff, uh, he, he says, number one trend is that uh, the boomer church will decline and eventually disappear. All right, all my boomer listeners, you guys are triggered right now. I can <laughs> I can feel it. I did not write this, okay? <laughs> I'm just reading the news. Um, Newhoff says, boomers are from about age 60 to 77 right now. They uh, have been the most affected by COVID attendance. Now, that's, that's provable, I, I think. I've seen some stats that boomers are the most hesitant to return to church for COVID. Understandably why. Um, your age... And stage of life is a risk factor. I get that. Um, so they returned to church less than any other generation um, in the post-COVID era. He also says boomers are, are moving out of their peak earning years and into their fixed income retirement years. And um, this is also true. He says the largest generational wealth transfer in human history is about to happen in the next few years as boomers pass away. Um, boomers, by the way, in case you guys don't know, are the they they control the most wealth in human history. They basically American boomers um, have. I saw the stat. Don't quote me on this. Something like eighty five percent of like all wealth uh, in in the country is held by boomers, and um, when they pass, that something's going to happen to those funds. They're either going to give them to their children. Uh, or estate planning to their church or institutions of their choice, charities. Um, so, you know, Newhoff is saying that there's a unique situation about to happen as boomers age, that they're, they're older, they're not going to be able to carry the, the physical load in church anymore. They're going to attend, but 
they're not going to carry the uh, necessarily the financial load and the physical load that they used to be able to carry. And churches that have singularly catered to boomers are going to have a hard time uh, navigating the passing of the boomers to Gen X, uh, which is behind them, and then millennials, which is behind them. Uh, he he kind of paints this picture in the article of the church that let's let's say you are a church that has a bunch of boomers and your boomers pass away and and they give their money to the church upon their death which is a wonderful thing uh but that doesn't that just gives money to the church it doesn't bring people to the church and so he kind of paints this picture of a a nice facility, lots of money, church, but no people in it. An empty built, a empty, very nice building, uh, with a, a comfortable budget, but no people. Uh, and that's what he's saying is going to be a trend of churches that have been boomer churches. And and he he would be able to define what he means by that. I'm not going to say what he I think he means by a boomer church, but um, that's trend number one. Number two. A spiritual openness of Gen Z. This is interesting. So, simultaneously, the most unchurched and most spiritually open generation is Gen Z. So, Gen Z is the young, the younger one right now. Uh, you know, late high school into college years is Gen Z right now. So, that's the most unchurched generation we've had, and also the most spiritually open, willing to talk, willing to consider spiritual things. Barna reports that 59% of Gen Z say that they are more open to God today than they were before the pandemic. 59% of, of Gen Z got more spiritually open after the pandemic. So what, what Newhoff is saying is there's a, there's a spiritual window that's open right now for Gen Z, and the, the churches that attempt to reach them will likely succeed and we'll see a uh, a wave of Gen Z be a part of their church and join, and the window's open now. So if you believe it, let's do it. <laughs> There's the trend. Number two. Uh, next trend, he says the line between digital and in-person will blur even more. So especially since 2020, uh, the church has been managing this sort of hybrid model of we do in-person church, but we also have this online version of what we do. And and churches have varied on the emphasis they put on the online version. So he's saying that that is not going to go away, that um, the the blur is going to continue between online and in-person. He gives an example in here of Taylor Swift's new album release. I thought this was a good example. Good job, Newhoff. He says... Taylor Swift's new album simultaneously topped the Spotify chart, which is digital, and also at the same time sold more vinyl records than the Beatles, Elton John, or Queen when vinyl was the only format available. Uh, At the same time, Swift's in-person concerts are so in demand that she broke Ticketmaster. Uh, I don't know if you guys saw that on the news about a month ago, but the the point that he's trying to make is, is that Younger people don't, they see digital and in-person as both viable and part of the same world. Um, they, they're not enemies of one another. They're just, they just are. There's a digital world and a digital life and a digital reality, and there's a physical world and a physical life and a physical reality. And um, his point is, when you do something really well and you invest in both, people will do both. So at the same time Taylor Swift is selling digital Spotify albums, she's also selling physical vinyl albums, and, and people are buying both. And they're going to the show. They're buying. They're spending huge amounts of money to go see her in person. And his point is these things don't have to be enemies of one another. When one is done well, it can feed the other. The digital can be a feeder for the physical, which I think we would all agree is better. The the physical, real, in person gathering is the is the ultimate. But I I would say 
this is a lesson that digital is not an enemy. It can be a feeder for the physical. That's my view of it. Um, next, number four. He, this is the same thing. Online ministry will see more results. So he says, many churches that turned to online ministry in 2020 and shut it down after the pandemic will miss out. Um, the new front door of the church is live stream and social media. Um, this is probably true. You know, you know, it used to be said that the front door of the church was the front door. Uh, people that wanted to visit your church drove to you and checked you out. And if they didn't like you, they didn't come back. Then after that, we were told it was the church website. They would go to the website and check you out, and then they would come visit the church. Uh, now they might watch several services online or listen to your pastor's podcast, um, several sermons online before they come. I've had people tell me when they've come visit our church, I'll shake their hand and say, hey, I'm Pastor Jared. Nice to meet you. And they'll say, oh, I feel like I already know you. And I'll say, why? I say, well, I've We've been listening to your to the sermon series. Uh, we've already listened. We're we're six episodes in, and uh, we've we've already been listening. This is our first time visiting in person, though. So, so they do they do they listen online. They might even binge a a series a sermon series before they come, so that they're caught up. That see it's they don't have to be again enemies of one another. They can work together. But his point there is that. Um, if you've invested in online and you've stuck with it, you're, 2023, you'll start seeing big results that you hadn't seen previously. And if you bailed out, if if pandemic ended and you said, oh, glad that's over with, and you cut your, your online ministry, you've, you will have missed out. That's his point. Okay. Number five, the purpose of the weekend sermon will shift from attractional to an anchor. Uh, I had to slow down and see what he meant by this. The, I think what he means is the, there's not a draw like there used to be of coming to hear the pastor in person. Now, he gives a caveat and says, if you're an excellent top-tier preacher, uh, there will always be people that want to come, and they will come. Um, so you're, if you're really good this doesn't apply to you, but he's talking about the mass quantity of pastors that fill, you know, your 80% of all your churches on any given Sunday. Um, you're not the attraction that you think you are because online is so prolific. Now people can go and they do, they go listen to every, any pastor they want to during the week. So it's pretty humbling for me to think that, you know, Someone coming to hear my sermon in person at Kirby Woods at 1030 could at this point, and probably did during the week, listen to John MacArthur, John Piper, David Jeremiah, you know, an old Adrian Rogers sermon. You know, they've already listened to it. They've, they've, they have listened that week to the best preachers on the planet, and then they come hear me. And, uh, I, you know, I hope one day that I get up in that in that grouping, but, man, you know, his point is you can't you can't bank on that being the reason people come because they can hear great sermons on demand from their pocket in five seconds. So there has to be more to it. And uh, he's saying that the sermon will be the anchor. It's still important. It's still the anchor of the whole church and of the whole week. Like that's a a serious important thing. If that's terrible, it will hurt you. But that's going to set up other things to be successful. Uh, and his examples are um, community, kids and student ministries, and co- a connection to one another that's felt a fellowship in the body. So the sermon allows those things to be the catch points, uh, the, the things that draw people and are unique about the church. Uh, so that's his, that's his uh, perspective. Next, there's only two more. Hang with me. The volunteer crisis, what he says. Number six, a volunteer crisis. So again, to go back to kind of a generational thing, he says, boomers were typically the backbone of volunteers in the church, but they are aging and COVID knocked out 22% of them. At the same time, millennials uh, are, though they are in their peak prime years of life, are infrequent attenders and they are absent from church at a higher percentage than boomers are. So therefore, they don't sign up for long-term commitments the same way boomers did. Um, I think this is probably true. 
you know, um, I saw it once that the, the definition that people would say for, I, I go to that church frequently used to be weekly and people have now changed that definition to monthly. So someone feels a, uh, it, like they go to your church if they go once a month. Uh, that didn't used to be the case, but it is now. So I think his point is that there there is a volunteer crisis that has already been in church, but it's going to get worse is the point. Um, the more boomers age out, the more volunteers are uh, going to be a commodity, a precious commodity to come by in churches. And then he does offer, though, uh, for the trend, the churches that buck the trend and do better are going to be those that paint volunteering not as um, a duty, a responsibility, a, well, you're a member of this church, so you you better ante up and serve. Not that, but rather uh, that it will be a, a spiritual benefit to you to plug into your place of service that God has for you, the way God's wired you to serve. You will be better for it if you engage that role and serve in his body. And when you phrase, those are two very different ways to phrase it. So he's saying that if you phrase it the second way, you will get a much better response for volunteers. Don't, don't post a list of needs and say, here's every need we have, who wants to do it? Ask the person what their passion is and what they are gifted and wired to do, and then find, and then plug them in where they're going to be best uh, suited to serve. Uh, so that's number six. Lastly, number seven, uh, he says pastoral burnout will stabilize. Pastoral burnout will stabilize. So kind of the, the key stat for this, in March of 22, 42% of pastors, according to Barna, said they had given serious consideration to leaving full-time ministry within the year. All right, so just 10 months ago, you had 42% of pastors saying in the previous year they were thinking about quitting. And as a baseline, if you go back to 2017, uh, that poll said only 11% of pastors had thought about quitting. So that would be like the baseline normal number at any given time. About 10% of pastors are thinking about calling it. Uh, But but because of probably the stressors of pandemic and economy, et cetera, the peak was March of 22, 42% of pastors were on the verge of, of quitting. And the, the trend, which is good, his trend is good, which says that's going to go backwards. Pastors are going to settle into where they are. The stress of the pandemic is going to minimize. They're going to realize they have what they have. They're going to make adjustments, and then they're going to settle back in. So um, that's really good news. I hope that that burnout – I hope pastors – take vacations and, and, um, cause you know, we, we, we were hauling uphill, you know, it, it was a hard couple of years there from 2020 to this, you know, I'd say 21. Uh, it was, it was tough. A lot of new challenges, things you'd never seen before, uh, mixed with political strife, you know, everything. It just kind of all worldview clashes, um, theological concepts being mainstreamed that that you know a lot of people weren't prepared for to deal with it was a tough couple of years and so now it's it's pretty much smoothing out i think that's great news and i I hope pastors including myself (laughs) will take a good vacation and sort of reset after this crazy period of years you know your your church is still standing uh praise god Uh, that's a wonderful thing. Go and have a moment to let your brain and your body reset after that weird uh, period of time. All right, so that's the list of Newhoff and Rayner, two guys that are pretty different from one another, two lists that are very different from one another, Uh, but that's their 2023 expected 
church trends. So maybe you guys thought that's a bunch of baloney, and I don't think any of that's going to happen. The only way to know is uh, we'll check we'll check at the end of this year and see how much of that comes true. And as you know, uh, the penalty for false prophecy is death. So how you guys have a wonderful week. I hope to see you guys in church. Uh, come and worship with us at Kirby Woods, 1030 a.m. Don't forget to subscribe to this podcast if you've not. And uh, share it with a friend who you think would enjoy it. God bless. Have a great week.